Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Sav. And I'm Jess, and welcome to And a Diet Soda, Episode 16, Innovative and Personalized Wellness. Yes, so today we'll be talking about a really interesting story and once again highlighting the importance of being your own advocate on your wellness journey. Ryan Overcash is a certified nutrigenomic counselor and patient advocate. That is a mouthful right there. It's so amazing. Yeah. Her company is Habit Method Health, and it provides innovative wellness consulting to those interested in optimizing their health by utilizing this personalized genomic testing. So lifestyle changes um, and healthy habits are her thing. So we're so excited to have you on today and learn all about what you do. Hi, it's Sav and Jess. Welcome to And a Diet Soda, an opportunity for people to celebrate their successes, share their failures, and hopefully give a little advice on all things relatable along the way. This community is for appreciating the little things and fostering positive mindsets and intuitive thoughts by talking to people, because chances are they've been through it too. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to share. This is my favorite thing to talk about. Yes. Awesome. So Ryan, on our intro call, you discussed with us that you spent nearly a decade trying to navigate your debilitating, debilitating autoimmune issues. So can you give us, this is a loaded question. Um, can you give us a background on your story and kind of what genomics is, how it fit into your life and how it allows you to now serve or guide you to help your own clients? Sure. Um, it really is a huge part of, of my consulting practice because it was an absolute game changer in my personal story. So I, like you said, it's been almost a decade struggling with this sort of strange array of symptoms that kind of left me bouncing from doctor to doctor. I was really having a hard time figuring out where to start untangling um, all, all of these different problems I was dealing with that were slowing me down in life. I went from a really happy, healthy young person to having trouble making it through the day um, with my energy crashes, having trouble keeping a job because I was in so much pain. And um, so eventually was diagnosed with something called dysautonomia, which unfortunately, even upon receiving a diagnosis really means nothing. It's kind of just a label for a bunch of symptoms. Uh, there was no treatment, no protocol and, and no path forward. So I started doing a lot of research and kind of found a protocol for myself that gave me a pretty immediate relief. And I was very impressed. And at the same time, I was kind of building out this life coaching business and helping others on their journey to wellness, whether that was diet, lifestyle, movement, uh, fitness. And it was just this kind of amazing thing to watch the same protocol that helped me start helping other people very quickly. And um, very soon after that, genomics came into the picture. And when I tell you that eating and changing my protocol for my genetic report changed my life, I really mean it. I think within about four weeks, I went from having some symptoms that had been with me for almost 10 years to feeling relief and feeling kind of like my old self again, which was um, absolutely treasured. Oh my gosh. Wow. I mean, it's so, it's so interesting to hear you talk about it because of course this has been your life and it, I feel like it's really easy sometimes to look back on it and summarize it in like, this is what happened. And, but in reality, it was like this huge journey and huge. This, yeah. This, yeah. And this big mountain to overcome. So, I mean, I'm really interested. Uh, your story is amazing. Was there like a defining moment where you were like, I need to be a part of this community, become a nutrigenomic counselor and make a difference in other people's lives? I don't know if there was a defining moment. I think my mom is, she tells the story kind of the best of, of everyone. She, it's really heart wrenching to hear her talk about how frustrated and scary it was to watch me sort of take this nosedive in my health and feel so helpless and frustrated. Um, we, I saw over 37 practitioners, specialists, I saw some of the best specialists in the country um, who really were at a loss on to give me any kind of advice or path forward. So it, I really was trying my best to be a good advocate and be a good patient. Um, it, it was just very, it was tough to figure out who I should listen to and kind of what methods would work for me, especially with the symptoms being all over the map. So genomics for me was the first time that someone handed me a report and said, 
by the way, did you know this isn't why you're, this is why you're not getting better? Or did you know that because of this, you're going to really need to do A, B, and C? And it was like having this really powerful math in my hand. All of a sudden, things seemed very clear and doable. Um, there was a path forward. And most importantly, there was a why behind all of my symptoms. Oh, my that. So for somebody, I mean, we know what genomics is, but I'm trying to remember that we have these, you know, everyday listeners who might not be into science. So what is nutrigenomics? What is that field of study? What does it look at? Um, and how can people communicate that information with their doctor? Sure. So nutrigenomics, um, also, similarly to epigenetics, looks at the area of genetics that we can control by use, utilizing diet, lifestyle, supplementation to either support or suppress the expression of these genes. So we aren't necessarily deleting any genetic information where the, the genes are intact the way they were when you were born. What we're doing is using the outside factors to really enhance or reduce the way that these genes express. So when we think about an overreaction in the immune system, obviously that's not the way that those, those um, immune regulators are supposed to work. They're just running an overdrive as protection. So our job is to sort of take this genomic report and break down the areas that either need us to support or suppress, lots of different ways to do that. And kind of the most beautiful thing about genomics is that it really can be applied to all of these different medical modalities. If you're someone who really likes a traditional Western approach, it can still be helpful. And if you are somebody who really likes more of um, a holistic or functional medicine approach, really incredibly helpful. So I think for everyone, um, the other thing I always like to add on when we're talking about just introducing someone to genomics is all of this is good information. There's no such thing as bad genes. Um, I know a lot of people think, oh, I, I, I have these mutations on my genes and therefore I'm doomed, or these symptoms are um, the reason that I'm gonna have this, this issue forever. And really that's not true. Um, once we know the why, we can really start putting together some good clues and some good recommendations to sort of get you past that and back to your optimal self. Okay, so what are some examples of, uh, just for myself, because um, I'm so curious, what are some examples of effects that would be from genomics versus versus something else? Like, would that be things like you were saying, like sleep, sleeping well, or bloating or something like that, or, or something different? Sure. You know, the, the example I like to use most often is a gene called CONC, catecholamine O-methyltransferase. And most of the time in genomics, we're really not talking about like a single gene to a single uh, symptom or expression. But in the case of COMT, it is highly linked to anxiety. If there's any one gene that I can tell you is a key player, it's probably that one. So COMT, highly linked to anxiety. If, if a patient comes to me and says, hey, I'm really dealing with this and I'd just like to know why, why is this happening to me? That's probably the first place I'm going to look. And then from there, we're going to start building out this whole genomic report to understand kind of like a map or a GPS system where we could bump into some potential problems in cellular function. Um, how when we're kind of talking about symptomatic expression, you know, I always like to tell people genetics are not the only thing. They're just a really good foundation, kind of like when you start building a house, you want to have a solid foundation everything else gets built up from there. So symptomatic expression, um, when we're really talking about understanding the why, genomics, helpful start point. And then we always want to include something like real-time testing, blood work, urinalysis, hormones, things like that. That's great. I was going to ask about that actually, is kind of what, what does that testing look like? And for me personally, on the nerdy side, what is what is it looking at? Like, is it looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms or what? what is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and, you know, people often kind of get this confused, like um, going back to this idea that it's dooming us to a fate. Definitely not. It's also not the same type of testing. If somebody, I think most people understand genetic testing as uh, like Down syndrome or eye color. And we're really not talking about um, binary genetic testing. It's not a yes or no. This is really about um, genetic expression and it can be really helpful. So it's all good information. That's awesome. So, um, and this, it, this is such a complicated topic. And, um, and when I was first learning about 
genomics and single nucleotide polymorphisms and like all these, all these different words, someone put this in perspective for me and it like really helped to get a visual. Uh, They use the example of like Monsters Inc and all the different doors that are uh, in Monsters Inc and how all of those doors would be like a single nucleotide and how if you like changed one, then it would change either how the whole system worked or where, where, if you open that door, where it would take you, something like that. So just to give people out there a little visual, if we're saying all these words and you're like, oh my God, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I, like, the door I hope I'm not aging Inc. myself. Is this, is this a movie? Monsters <laughs> Inc.? I'm probably totally aging myself. Yeah, but I don't know. Do I need to see this? Because it sounds like I would love this. Yeah, <laughs> oh my gosh. it's a Disney movie. It's great. It's so great. Okay. You have to see it. Oh I'm going to track it down. Okay. Yeah. So I don't ever watch TV. I feel like I live under a rock. I don't know any of these like cool like ref- social references. But I no, that's okay. No, Monsters Inc. was like, I think it came out maybe in like 2000. It's got to be like five or three, something like that. Something early. But that's, I love that, Jess. That's like a perfect, it's so hard for somebody who doesn't know about DNA or genes. That's a great way to consider like this line of these doors hanging and like these are your, this is your DNA and these are the tiny little pieces that might differ. So um, I know it's a challenging concept, but it's really worth looking into if you have a couple minutes. I want to watch this so I can maybe steal this reference. I think this is going to be great for listeners. Yes. Yes. That's so great. Um, okay. So before we get into a little bit more about your personal story and everything, I was just, um, hoping that we could talk about the report, what that looks like, and then also, um, how the nutrition fits into that and how that helped you. And if there's a combination between like supplements, nutrition and sleep and all these different things, I just want to see how getting this report typically looks for somebody. So at this point, we're going to, cover the screen with the report so you can talk about it however you'd like. One thing I'll say about um, genomic testing that usually doesn't get get covered in podcasts and then I always end up getting a lot of questions is like, what does the test look like? And for listeners that are curious, it is just a little cheek swab. So imagine like a long Q-tip, we take it, rub it on the inside of the cheek, you mail it in and the report gets sent to you. So it's really easy. There's no blood draw. You don't have to go to a doctor's office to do this. I always recommend utilizing provider grade testing so that you are working with a professional to sort of help you implement these findings. Some of the consumer based tests along with like privacy issues and, you know, not being sure where your data is going to end up. um, They also have a little bit less relevance in terms of like medical information. So I always think it's helpful. Do your homework, make sure that you understand what you're getting. Genomics, the beautiful thing about it, you only have to test one. So if you do it right the first time, you don't have to come back for more. Um, so when we kind of are looking at this test, um, this is a provider grade test. These are the ones that I use with my concierge clients. It, I think it makes it pretty easy for a patient too, because it's color coded in a way that you can see very clearly, um, you know, where we really need to provide adequate support. Cool. This is just one page of a, uh, usually a, a very long report And what I like to do is really customize a report for a patient so that we're getting relevant data, whatever they're looking for answers on, um, you know, well, I'll take a pretty detailed medical history first, learn a lot about their lifestyle, what they're willing to do and not do in terms of making changes. And then from here, we can kind of build a customized report to um, answer a lot of the, the whys behind some of their symptoms. So when we're looking at this report, you'll notice in the top right corner, there are kind of three colored tabs. So green meaning no clinical abnormality or a wild type. That means the gene's probably going to be able to express the way that it should. It's going to express appropriately. Um, Heterozygous result or a single broken mutation means that we should probably pay attention. Um, I've heard some practitioners reference things like 40 to 60 percent down regulation in genetic expression. Um, I don't know that I can confirm that across the board or if we're just talking about specific um, specific areas of function. And then the red tab, homozygous, uh, double broken copy, means this is really where we should be spending our energy and our focus, making sure that we're supporting these pathways with either nutrition, supplement, lifestyle changes, so that everything downstream is really getting the benefit of some of this upstream targeted precision nutrition. I like the color coding because it makes sense 
yeah a lot of sense like green is like you're good to go you're fine we don't have to pay attention to it yellow is like let's watch it caution and red is like highlighting it like let's take care of this like a literal red flag yeah yeah I was going to say that I never tell somebody like we can completely ignore these green ones because whenever we're talking about genomics, we're really interested in a pattern. We're looking at analyzing the patterns that we find and kind of like the way um, a basketball player relies on his teammates. Every sniff in this group is relying on the next set of data to sort of pick up the slack if there's down regulation present. So we want to make sure that we aren't completely ignoring something. We're just realizing it might not need the same support as maybe the double broken copy. Awesome. My question was, as far as epigenetics goes, I mean, we are aware that our genes can be modified or not modified genetically themselves, but that these different things can be methylated or acetylated, whatnot. But does that ever change? Like, do we see, do you see that in your reports? Like if maybe somebody's in a very stressful environment, how that might impact, like you said, maybe their anxiety or something, what does that typically look like based on their environment? Yeah. So one of the things that people always ask me is how do I know if I'm improving? How do I know if I'm, when I'm supporting this, am I, am I doing the right thing? And usually my answer is we are going to feel it. You are, I mean, in my case, I was feeling this pretty quickly. I was feeling a noticeable improvement um, within a month. Um, Does the report ever change? No. This is kind of like you taking um, like a screenshot of a a map of a city. Certain areas are going to have like high, high traffic zones all the time. And if there's a wreck in that area, obviously it's going to get worse. So the report doesn't change. This is why with genomics, you can really test one, one and done. Um, From there, you know, when we're, there's a lot of real-time testing that can actually back up and support this. So if I have um, a client who has a lot of methylation issues and we really need to support those pathways, we can then use annual blood work to determine if we're on the right track. If somebody has something like a VDR TAC on that um, report, the bottom gene on there talks about VDR TAC or vitamin D receptor, blood work is a great indicator for whether or not our vitamin D is in optimal range. So just knowing kind of where the potential hurdles are is where the test can come in handy. So when somebody does get the report from you um, and they say, let's, let's talk about the VDR tag again, and maybe they need to increase their vitamin D, whether that's with a supplement or going outside, whatever that may look like, um, do they typically stay on this regimen long-term or once they get there, you want to stable it out and kind of wean off supplements? What does that typically look like? You know, I think that's different just depending on each person's comfort level. I work with people and the reason my company is called the Habit Method is I want this to be so easy. I want it to be like implementing your daily routine. It's no big deal. I never want somebody to feel like they're on a, just a bucket of pills every day. Um, that would just definitely not be doable for me. So I'm really interested in building out a protocol that is sustainable for life. Um, so I think learning somebody's comfort level is kind of the first step in determining that. Um, I think there's, it's always best for us to try to get improvement in diet and lifestyle first. I'll be very quick to tell someone like supplements cannot tackle a bad diet. There's just no, you can't offset a bad diet with um, a handful of vitamins. So let's try to reduce symptoms, whatever, in whatever way we can, and then use supplements to do just that, to supplement. Um, I think one of the really interesting discussions happening right now, sort of in functional and integrative medicine is how bioavailable are the nutrients in our food supply? We've seen this like incredible um, downgrade in available nutrients and even things like our produce, especially our meats, our our dairy products and things like that. So um, for me, there's probably a handful of supplements that I'm just better when I take them. So doing a lifetime of that's no problem for me, especially because I think of it as sort of preventative maintenance Um, and then improving diet and really figuring out how I can adjust my lifestyle to sort of support these. um, I think that's critical. Absolutely. So um, can we talk a little bit about the nutrition part of the nutrigenomics then? So when obviously these are very personalized results and it's great. I think it's the way the future is going to have to work is to be personalized in medicine and healthcare and wellness overall. Um, so when somebody is to, you know, learn about their genomics, um, 
do you then work with them to find a diet or a lifestyle that kind of works for them? Um, and also does this, um, show, um, food intolerances or maybe allergies as well for their, their nutrition? Sure. So this is a great time for me to tell people too. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a licensed medical practitioner. My job is sort of education and sort of helping them build a foundational understanding of what in the world we're looking at. Like you said, nutrigenomics is a mouthful. So sometimes just getting out these definitions, um, my job is really to arm them so that when they do meet with a pr practitioner or a clinical nutritionist, they are very clear on what the goal is, what we're talking about, and why this is important to their health. So I don't really, um, I really like to refer people to a clinical nutritionist if we need to build a detailed diet plan. I think that that's very helpful. I, I'm not a huge fan. Gen Genomics is very nuanced. So let me start by saying that. So I think every provider um, and everyone who interprets a panel might have their own little take on um, kind of where the focus is and, and really what each patient should be doing to, to optimize or where to start. One thing that I learned, um, not just in my own experience, but with, with patients, is that the timing of a protocol is absolutely critical. So let's use that report, for example. We have something on there called the H HLA-DQ2A, and this is a celiac gene. And what we know about celiac disease is not only that it's an autoimmune condition, but it can often express in things um, outside of the GI tract, like um, mood disorders, psoriasis, eczema, um, food intolerances outside of gluten because the immune system is under attack. So if we were to ignore that gene and then try to um, support all of the other areas that need our help, like symptomatic expression and uh, anxiety or depression, we probably wouldn't get very far. So a lot of the thought process in um, genomic findings is to downregulate the areas of over overreaction, like immune dysfunction, support inflammation, support autophagy, which if you aren't familiar with this term, autophagy, go Google. It won the Medical Nobel in 2016. It's pretty incredible. And um, we can come back and talk about that. And then try to upregulate and support by adding in nutrition and B vitamins. Um, I think that understanding why we're doing something in a specific order is sometimes a difficult hurdle for your doctor to explain. Um, I think customized nutrition is absolutely critical, and this test can make that really helpful, really easy. Um, I think um, Americans in particular, for some reason, we've sort of like gone off the deep end as far as what is healthy. And oftentimes a client will come to me and say, I am just so overwhelmed going in the grocery store. Where do I even start? So my job is sort of like calm them down, rein it in, make sure that we understand, you know, this categorize what is real food, whole food, and what is maybe pretending to be food, um, really help them examine some of those things. Well, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm going off the deep end a little bit here because as you're talking, I like, so last week we talked to someone who did a, was talking about a comprehensive blood panel and how that affects how she learned about her hormones, her food intolerances, her, uh, her vitamins and, and everything. And I feel like this is just one step deeper, which is so cool. And then it got me thinking about, um, you know, like CRISPR Cas9 and gene editing and how this is very real in our world with like genetic diseases, like take cystic fibrosis or something where you can have uh, an embryo if you make an embryo in the lab and then gene edit that embryo to fix the, the genomics. And so I'm, I'm just like thinking yeah, about- Yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just saying how cool- how cool that is in the future. Like, if yeah. is, um, I mean, this is so like ethically on either yeah. the scale here, but like, wow. <laughs> it, it's definitely becoming more mainstream. When, when I was struggling with symptoms, it was, um, it was pretty fringe and it was very difficult for me to find a practitioner who not only could kind of inform me, but also figure out what to do. And there was just no one. In fact, I had three or four people look at my report and just be like, well, I don't know what this is, but like, I guess we can try, like, we'll give you some cyanocobalamin and hope you live. But really the first, when, as soon as someone got a hold of it, that knew what to do, it was like, bam, 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 you're done. That's all you need. And it, I really, I fought them. I mean, I'm sure I was such a pain in the butt patient. Cause I was like, there's no way this is going to work. I just don't believe you. So <laughs> here we are. It seems like witchcraft. Eat my words. Yeah. So 
if we want to circle back then to the um, like food intolerances and allergies, then that would be great to hear about. One of the things I hear all the time from people um, is I know I'm not celiac. I have already had an IgG test or an IgA test. And I think one of the important things to recognize is that's a, a kind of a measure of immune function. Like how is the immune system reacting to being introduced to, the, to these items? Um, what, when we're talking about celiac disease, there's really two good ways to indicate uh, the presence of celiac or pre-celiac um, um, immunity or response. And one is a biopsy, a small bowel biopsy, which for parents with small children can seem like overkill. And um, the second way is genetics. So I think that that's, you know, if it was my child and I had the choice between a biopsy and a cheek swab, that would be a pretty easy choice. Um, because something like celiac is a developed issue, this can be something that preventatively could save this child a lot of health issues down the road. And I know I, I like hear this from moms all the time. Well, gosh, I don't want to cook a whole separate meal for this one kid. Well, if that kiddo has a copy or two copies, it's very likely that so, at least one parent has it. So uh, the entire family could probably abide by some of these changes too and um, really benefit from making making small changes day to day. Totally. I, you always get my thoughts going. That's the great part of like education. <laughs> um, I have my entire, like, I'm like every single woman in my family seems to have celiac disease or intolerances. Um, and I have a really bad gluten intolerance. Maybe it's deeper than that. But um, as far as things like I can eat like sprouted grains and stuff, and I can have things that are truly like sprouted whole grains versus like, if I walked up and ate a piece of white bread, it would just not be a pretty sight. So do you know, we can cut this out if you don't know, but I just wanted to know what your thoughts on that were. Well, I'll tell you, one of the really interesting things that I got to listen in on last year was um, a provider workshop where we were talking a lot about underlying issues with, with gut dysfunction and specifically people with celiac, um, celiac disease or that were diagnosed, not necessarily had the genetics, but people who had been diagnosed um, with celiac disease and maybe reasons that they weren't improving on a celiac friendly diet. And this practitioner's presentation basically said, um, the first thing that they noticed is no one knew what a celiac friendly diet was. They basically were finding things in the grocery store that had a gluten-free label and thinking, great, I'm good to go. So I think education being one, I know you're super duper smart and you are very clear on that for a lot of listeners, I think. Um, that can be a struggle because they think, well, if I just cut out bread and oftentimes they ask me, well, are potatoes gluten free? Um, and I have to sort of take this deep dive with them onto, you know, what's the difference even between celiac friendly and gluten free foods. So education, number one, there are some really great resources. If you guys are interested, we can throw them in the show notes, um, some really easy places to find good, helpful tips. Um, and then the second thing that they found was a sensitivity to glyphosate or pesticides. Um, and this is one reason that a lot of celiacs tend to benefit from something like glutathione or NAC um, because they, their body may be having a hard time differentiating between the, the wheat and the embedded um, pesticide. And I have had about six patients tell me so far, I went to Europe, I ate the wheat, I ate the bread and the croissants and everything. And I felt fine. And I wasn't having any kind of response, but I come home and I, you know, have a crouton and I'm down for three days. So I think that that's a really interesting area of study. I'd like to, to kind of learn more about. Definitely. Yeah. I think the glyphosate conversation is a huge one. Um, there's a lot of education around that and a lot if somebody listening wants to learn, I would recommend just doing, we always just say educate, educate, educate. <laughs> it might be yeah. a lot to tell them consistently, but I, it's really important to just take a look and, and learn about these really important things that might be affecting your body and your health, things that you might not even have ever considered. And sad, the other thing, I think that people kind of, uh, at least people that are just like new to the world of celiac tend to, to miss um, is the fact that the celiac, the gliadin protein looks almost identical to the casein protein to your body. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people diagnosed with celiac don't, don't think about cutting out um, dairy products. And I think the thing I see the most, but the most problems with is like a whey protein. 
And I see people with celiac disease really struggling to be able to utilize powdered whey proteins, especially like, um, you know, bodybuilders, uh, people in fitness, they seem to, to really have not only GI issues, but a lot of immune dysfunction. Definitely. If you're cool with it, we want to switch a little bit to the mental health component throughout this whole process for you. Um, like you said earlier, and you shared your story that you struggled for nearly a decade with all of this, what was that like for you mentally, emotionally, and how did it change after you were able to find some answers in a lifestyle that really worked for you? Um, you know, truthfully, I think I ha I was incredibly blessed to not deal with a lot of the, um, the brain health issues that are associated with chronic disease. I was pretty young when I first started having symptoms. I was 19 and I thought this was so strange that I went from being this kind of like normal, healthy person who was super active and could do anything and abundant energy to feeling um, so tired that it was painful for me to lift my head off the pillow. Um, feeling like I didn't look like myself. Um, I grew up, I, I had a, a really teeny tiny record deal. I was always performing, singing, dancing on a stage. And slowly the way that I looked um, was, well, I say slowly, not slowly, to me pretty quickly. I was, my the way that I looked changed. My face was getting um, kind of swollen and puffy. My hair was falling out. My skin looked 15 years older than I was. And that really took a toll on, I won't say my self-esteem, but sort of my, my, um, my internal fuel, like didn't really inspire me to want to go out and do things. Being physically so tired in your 20s, that should have been a pretty good clue, in my opinion, um, to, to doctors that something was really wrong. And I remember a couple of doctors saying things, I wish I had made like little memes or something, but they would say things like, well, maybe just don't eat beer and cheeseburgers or, uh, well, you know, you're 22 now, you just might get fat and not feel good. It's like, wait, what? Like that whole way of thinking just kind of now looking back, like blows my mind. So um, just when we first started, you were talking about like replaying this in my head. And those are really like the standout, like little flashbacks I have all the time. Just the things now when a patient comes to me and says, you know, I'm in the hospital and my doctor refuses to, or I'm really frustrated that that is what fires me up and makes me want to go fight for somebody um, and really use my story to help guide them through theirs. So I think that um, a lot of what I went through could have been avoided. Um, I, I'm so lucky that I didn't ever struggle with sort of feeling like this was a, a black hole. It's just not in my nature. I was like, okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to get through this? And kind of became a little pit bull. But whenever I'm working with a, a patient who's dealing with um, significant changes in their brain health, their mood, um, their energy levels, I think it's really important for us to think about two things. One, um, where are we going to start? If we think about neurotransmitters sort of being at the very bottom of these geared buckets, we've got mitochondrial health way up here, and then we've got the ability for your body to methylate. We've got nutrition. So how well is your body in taking food as fuel and putting it to work? And then way down at the bottom, we have hormones and neurotransmitters, which as far as like cellular expense, they're very expensive. So what's the first thing your body can cut and still survive? neurotransmitters. So if we want to support those, we've got to really work upstream and make sure that everything else is working properly. This kind of goes back to that same, like I should make a t-shirt that says this, but kind of addressing the root causes and not the symptoms. So things like um, mood, depression, anxiety, OCD, insomnia, even um, weight gain, all of these things are symptoms. We want to stay focused on the root cause to resolve those heard over and over, like treat the person, not the symptom. And if that's not exactly what you preach, then I don't know what is like, that's, that's just so amazing. And it's sad that I know that you're so inspired to help other people. And that's so wonderful, but I hope you give yourself the credit that you deserve as a 19 year old, being that big of an advocate for yourself is so rare. And I'm so happy that you were able to get through that and then turn it into this whole industry that you're turning it into. I mean, this, this really is. Well, I mean, I just feel like 
it kind of came about organically because I just really believe there was just no reason for anybody else to go through what I went through. And if I could teach them, you know, four or five tips that could have saved me a lot of time and money, I feel like it's probably my obligation to do so. Absolutely. I went through a very similar situation of having to advocate for myself. Um, Mine came from a lot of a a car accident and a lot of traumatic brain injury. But for me, um, nutrition was the one thing that like saved me. And I didn't have a genomic test or anything, but I just knew that I was so inflamed and I was just some young college kid. And I finally started to learn about everything. And I'm not kidding you when I say like, I thought it was heavy. And I mean, I did have like some more fat on me than I thought, but like when I could relieve that inflammation, like everything felt better. Like it was internal, it was external. My face was skinnier, everything. So um, if you don't mind sharing, we're just curious um, how your nutrition looks now and what you do to like keep yourself alive and happy and well. Yeah, no, I'd love to share. I'm not, I'm really not afraid to kind of throw myself under the bus on this one, but as a kid, I was kind of like a, a pizza Like I did grew up not eating meat. Um, I wasn't that interested in vegetables. I really like my diet was pretty much like peanut butter and jelly, um, chocolate milk, um, maybe like a snack cake, a mashed potatoes. Those were kind of my staples. And I really was kind of grossed out by the idea of, of meat. So my mom being, you know, really trying to help get me some nutrition found this product called textured vegetable protein, which we kind of know now is like burgers. Um, You guys might know this as like um, uh, soy burgers or uh, soy nuggets. I'm not going to say that that was a epigenetic trigger for me. I'm just saying eating large amounts of any kind of highly processed food, probably not very good for autoimmune issues, but we didn't know that then. And so, um, I think like a lot of parents, they were just trying to make sure that I was, you know, getting enough food, but I have a lot of memories of like, we'd be on a road trip and, um, we'd go to McDonald's drive through and I'd get a burger with a no, no burger, just the bun. So it was like white bread and ketchup. And thinking about that now, like my, those, these were like my formative years. My body was trying to build like, you know, brain cells and immune cells. And instead I was feeding it basically like nutrient poor food, pretend food, basically. So um, in that instance, it's kind of impressive that I made it, but, um, you know, ramen noodles were a big staple. So um, now the big changes that I made, you know, I really learned how to like and enjoy a couple of, um, I, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I would say I eat really, really high quality portions of white fish and um, grass fed beef. Um those are probably my two go-tos and a lot of leafy greens. Um, I tend to, I, I don't, I don't usually say that I fit my diet into like one specific category or trendy diet, but I tend to like, um, pretty heavy plant-based. I like to get as many colorful veggies in my day as I can. Um, I'll even sneak like ground, um, little bits of mushroom into something like taco meat so that I know I'm getting an extra little source of vitamin D in there. Um, just kind of figuring out a way to make it easy. I know we're all busy and nobody has time to cook a three course meal. Um, so making sure that you have staples around the house, I think that that's something that became, um, a must do for me in order to eat right. Um, in order to have, um, the adequate things around me, I just needed to, to prepare. So lots of produce. Um, I eat eggs. I don't do dairy. I avoid gluten. I don't have the celiac gene, but for me, it just is one more immune trigger that, I can cut out and feel okay. So that's kind of where I start. But people always laugh because I have a couple of um, TikTok videos where I'm holding like a glass of green something and people will always ask me like, what are you drinking in there? And it's just usually like some veggies and some, something yummy. Nice. Yeah. I One of the things that I want to start doing that you clearly do is, and you probably don't even realize that you do it anymore, uh, but when you are like mushrooms for a little extra vitamin D, like you think that's a really good exercise for people to do is stop looking at food as, oh, well, this is this is green, so it must be healthy and, um, and just point blank and start translating it into what are the micronutrients that I get out of this? Because then yeah. I think it'll, it'll start to click more. I mean, you nailed it with the term micronutrient. I think that that is, um, 
that's the biggest thing. That's, that's a topic that I'm constantly having to combat is helping people who come to me and they say, well, I'm eating protein and I'm not eating fat and I've cut all carbs. And I'm, I'm realizing that the focus for them has really been on macros and never about micronutrients. And we know now that, um, you know, brain health, uh, osteoporosis and osteopenia, all of these things are preventable with um, proper micronutrients. So yeah, my, my focus, exactly. I think that's a great way to summarize it. It's just, I really made the transition to focusing on micronutrients and making sure that I'm reading labels. I'm not trusting that, you know, if something says like full of greens or something like that, that, that it really is. Um, that's that I know that stuff that can be super overwhelming for people. No, it's amazing. Um, I'm wondering what, what sort of advice, like, is there any piece of advice that you give either new clients or people that reach out to you over social media who are struggling with their health and being told that nothing is wrong? Oh man, that is such a passion topic of mine. Um, so this summer I'm launching a couple of education series to really help people. Like my goal is really to get this information, um, genomics and just a functional approach to, to your health out to as many people as I can. I want to um, help people avoid the pitfalls that I bumped into uh, any chance I get. Um, so we're gonna roll out some small education series. And one of the things that I talk a lot about in my patient advocacy courses is how not to talk to your doctor. Um, I used to walk in with, one day I'll show you guys, I'll send you pictures. And then this giant three ring notebook and I'd like shove it at a doctor and say, Hey, um, can you take a look at this? And they're looking at, you know, four years of lab reports. And I realized that that doesn't really get me anywhere. A doctor's just sort of overwhelmed, thinks I'm crazy and, you know, backed up. So one of the things I talk about in patient advocacy is how to, how to talk to your doctor, how to ask them for their help in a specific issue, really come in organized. I teach my clients how to organize not only their medical information, their personal information and their questions with their goals in a way that their doctor can very clearly tell them, yes, I'm the right match for you or no, I'm not. Um, so if somebody tells you that, you know, let's say this is probably the most common one, a female goes to their doctor and says, I think I might have hypothyroidism. I think my thyroid might be sluggish. Can you help me run a full thyroid panel, six or seven thyroid hormones? And the doctor says, no, but we can run TSH, um, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. That's a fight I hear five to 10 times a week. One thing I would ask, ask your doctor, why? Why won't you run it? And sometimes they'll say things like, well, your insurance won't cover it. Well, at that point, you can say, okay, I'm happy to cash pay. Or if they say, I don't think it's necessary, you can ask them something like, if I am meeting all the criteria for symptoms of hypothyroidism, what would you suggest? Because they probably are not going to medicate you without running tests. And if they aren't going to run tests, your options then are go cash pay for tests or find a new doctor that's willing to work with you. Um, I think as a patient, it's your job to decide um, where you spend your time and your money. I know for a lot of people dealing with insurance and making sure that you're using a provider um, that's within those bounds, that's, that's tough, but um, decide what your options are. And if you need a patient advocate, reach out to someone. I love that. I think that's, that's hard because I, that is the number one limitation factor is money, insurance, all of the budget. Cause at budget. Yeah. For me, especially that, like, that's just like so cloudy. Like the, the first half of this conversation really up until now, it's easy to get passionate about it and be like, oh my gosh, yeah, I'm going to go out, I'm going to find answers. And the minute you're sitting in that doctor's office, filling out all that paperwork is really easy to lose that motivation and be like, what am I doing? This, this is too much. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I do with my, my um, one-on-one clients, but anyone can do this. You don't have to have me do this for you. I always ask for a consultation before I pair a patient with a practitioner. I'll call and say, you know, hi, Dr. Jones, we're really interested in, in coming to meet with you. I'm calling on behalf of patient A, and she's really interested in resolving these symptoms. Do you think that you're the right match for us? And sometimes they'll give me 15 or 30 minutes to kind of run the case by them. And other times they'll say, um, yes, but uh, they'll give me, you know, maybe some problems, some hurdles, some things that they do or don't. And that will allow me to qualify or disqualify them as a good match for somebody. Um, there are a lot of patient advocacy programs there's a lot of great free information online. It can be really tough to weed through the quality information and kind of the junk. So um, 
I would say just ask a lot of questions, ask your friends who they like, who they use. And um, I, I have a, a GP in my little tiny town that takes my insurance and she is amazing and willing to run any tests I ask for. Um, so find someone that feels like they're on your team. You want a teammate, not tug of war. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to hear that. And on this topic of um, advocacy, I want to know a little bit about the support system. Um, how important was it in your journey? How, like, what role does it play in the clients that you work with? I mean, personally, that was a huge necessary in my life. You know, it's important. It was important for me yeah. to have that. So what is that? What is your experience with that been like? I mean, my parents are amazing humans and, you know, we're so incredible at supporting me. I never once felt doubted. Um, I think that's really tough when you're dealing with invisible symptoms. Sometimes the people around you um, have a hard time determining whether or not this is all in your head. And as a patient, I think that can be really alienating. So I, I think it's important to surround yourself with people. You know, when you were asking me that question, the thing that came to mind is, probably the opposite of an answer for this. Sometimes I deal with patients who have sort of like built their entire identity around their symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I see this a lot on um, like their Instagram handle. It'll be like chronic pain girl or, um, you know, PCOS girl or something like that. And for me, that's, that's a kind of a red flag because if you're defining your yourself by your symptoms, how are you ever supposed to get better? I really think if you if you want to go to a, a support group for your symptoms, that's great. As long as you are aligning yourself with people who are task oriented and really believe that this is um, this is you can resolve these symptoms. Um, if you I, I do not spend my energy fighting with people anymore who have decided that they are going to be ill forever. Um, that is probably the, the type of patient that I decline working with. Um, that's certainly your prerogative, but I think it's there are very few scenarios where somebody is going to be um, sick for, for life, um, at least in, in kind of like the areas that I'm qualified to deal with. So I, I think surround yourself with people that bring you up and not down and um, want to work to help you resolve issues. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it does. One hundred percent. And it's important to know how to treat your provider as well, and also how to reflect inwards with your own illness or whatever symptoms you may be experiencing. Um, if I don't know why this popped into mind, because I know you said that you like had your recording deal and stuff. How did that? Did you stop singing because of everything that you were going through? What happened? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I probably would have anyway, but I um. You know, I just grew up like a lot of kids do, like doing fun talent shows. And it was it was a blast. And um, God bless my mother for driving me into every single dance rehearsal and um, costume fitting. But uh, yeah, it was it was really difficult. And my right after high school, um, I was flying a lot. And that was it was very taxing on my body. I'm sure that definitely contributed to some of these um, sort of like immune triggers that debilitated me. Um, I was just reserved. I was burning the candle at both ends and really not paying attention to anything that could have been supporting my body. I was probably not sleeping at all. I was eating really j poor junk food, you know, in the airports and um, just really didn't probably didn't know any better. But it was it's so interesting to me kind of looking back that nobody thought to tell me that or to educate me on you know, if my body is my machine, how to support that. So I think that really could have been avoidable. Um, but yeah, it, it changed my life for sure. Getting sick changed my life so many times. Um, some Sometimes good ways, because here I am with you guys, but um, other times it, it just really changed the trajectory of, of what I was going to do with, with my time. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, and here you are changing other people's lives too now. Uh, so. I hope that's the goal. Yeah. Some, some days. I think, oh, that's really, absolutely. I think it's a great personality trait. One that I strive to have too, is to take your experiences for the better and try to utilize those um, tools for helping others and educating and teaching others because it's a lonely roller coaster sometimes for sure. So definitely. And, and, you know, it was, it, it, sometimes it's still hard, but I have to also come to terms with the fact that um, 
I probably can't help everyone. Some people don't want help and not, my way is not the right way for everyone. Um, you definitely don't have to have a genomic report in order to improve your health. Like obviously you are a great, um, great poster child for that. I think that just knowing why you're doing something is really important. I would really encourage somebody to not just like go to the grocery store and buy a bunch of supplements, really understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, save your time, save your money, do your research. Um, when you get stuck, reach out, ask for help. Yes. Right. Thank you for yes. saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huge tip. <laughs> right. I know it's so frustrating when I see like as on social media, all these trends and everything of like this one thing that I've been doing and then everybody goes and buys it. And I'm like, do you, did you even look it up? Like, do we know what we're doing here? Um, but you definitely try to educate in so many different ways between all the podcasts you go on your business itself. And then your free webinar series, which I'm really excited to check out. Can you talk a little bit about that and where to find it and, and all that? Yeah. So last year um, was 2020 was kind of a strange transition for me. So I went from doing a lot of this in person, um, getting to really interact with somebody to doing a lot of it remotely and kind of learning how to get to know somebody across the country. So um, it's been wonderful and it's opened the doors. I've met people I probably never would have encountered otherwise. Um, but I think that it's, it's really tough trying to get information out that's meant to be unique. And, you know, we're all unique. Your protocol should be unique. What we ha- how we execute your findings should, should be really unique to you and your life. Getting that out on a large scale is pretty tough. So I want to make sure that we aren't losing the personal element of this bio-individualized medical approach. Um, with the free webinars, my goal is to really help people understand what we're testing, you know, what is genomics? How can this help you? Um, what what type of test maybe I made the mistake of buying or purchasing? There weren't a lot of options when I first started um, testing myself. But um, now I'm, I get sent tests all the time and I get to guinea pig them before recommending them. And I feel like I've got a pretty good idea of um, what's worth someone's time and money and what's not. But I think and the other thing we're going to cover in this webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about my story and kind of why genomics was such a key in the lock moment for me when, you know, like you said, Sab, like things looked normal. My labs often looked normal. I was incredibly symptomatic, but no one could tell me why. Um, understanding the role that genomics plays and understanding that genomics isn't everything. It's the starting point. So um you know, just really helping people clarify what, what we're doing here. If, if you decide that you want to test, um, this free webinar will actually have access to a test that I customized. I'm so excited about this because I have struggled for so many years finding a test that I can really get behind and put my stamp of approval on. And so um, for people that maybe either can't work with me one-on-one, maybe, um, you know, it's not within their budget or their time, you know, they've got pretty, a lot of demands in their life this would be a way for them to start to optimize their health on their own time, a little bit at a time um, and and just learn as they go. That's great. That's amazing to hear. Um, Free access to this webinar to learn more and to um, dive a little bit deeper into Ryan's story as well. So we'll drop that in the show notes. And then um, that's all for our questions for you. Um, We want to uh, announce the weekly challenge. I don't know if you, want to give it a go at announcing the challenge for sleep this week? So this week's health challenge is to work on improving your sleep. Um, One of the best things that you can do to support your health is to improve your circadian rhythm. And that involves going to bed and waking up at close to the same time every day, making sure that you are reducing the amount of screen and light happening after sundown and um, taking some time in the morning to get in the sun, get in the sunlight before 10 a.m. so that your body is really aware that it is it is daytime. And I think that that is a great tip for everybody um, just working on little baby steps towards optimal health. Yes, thank you. And I wanted to um, show this really fast. If you don't have access to going outside, this is literally the light box that sits on my desk. And you, it's like up to 10,000 lux, I think. But you can literally buy something on Amazon for like $20 that will, it's obviously not as good as the sun. So if you can go outside, do that. 
but a lot of us work inside and at desks and sometimes I can't do that. So there's a lot of opportunities to find a way to get your morning sunlight in that will help regulate that sleep for you as well. So, and uh, more, I love that. <laughs> yeah. I want to get, I want to get your link for your little light box. I think yes. Great. I will send that to you here. Let me write that down. Um, it's honestly great. It really does help me. It's kind of bright at first, but there's also, I don't know if you, if you, either of you are interested in this or maybe the listeners, but, um, there's an app called my Lux on your phone. So like right now I have my ring light and like, it tells you how many Lux you are at. So if you're sitting at night at 9 PM and you're surrounded by lights, you can look at how much light is surrounding you as well. So you can try to yeah that and get your sleep, um, under control as well. So we'll have lots. I of- love that. <laughs> lots of, yeah, lots of- I know that's a- Something we didn't talk a lot about in um, in this chat is, you know, people that deal with insomnia, but I think there are some really great um, genomic reasons why, I mean, like the GAD mutation, I've seen like change people's lives and some of the supplements just support GAD is just so simple. It's like magnesium. Um, it's, it's really amazing when we can, like people will call me and be like, uh, am I supposed to like suddenly have this change? Yes, that is the goal. That's the idea. That's amazing. Yeah, that's, I have a sibling who really struggles with sleep. And I'm like, there's got to be something here we can do, whether it's a sleep study or something. So maybe genomics is a good option to try for sure. Always. Um, Yeah, always my favorite. Yes. Uh, we're going to do our, this or that speed round challenge now. So Jess is going to start, but we're just going to toss, um, a couple of options out to you and you pick the one that sounds the best. And if you have something that you okay. want to say, you totally can. Sure. Well. Uh, of all the things, this is the one that got me nervous. Now I wish I had had that extra cup of coffee, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very fitting since our first question is tea or coffee. Coffee. No or rain. Mm. <laughs> Neither. Sunshine? Um, rain. <laughs> cardio or weights? Oh, I probably prefer cardio, but I should go do my weight. <laughs> Me too. Um, shopping in store or online? In store, any day. Apples or bananas? Bananas. Getting things done or procrastinating? Oh, I'm so bad at both. Um, I'm going to say getting things done makes me feel better. Uh, lake or beach? Beach. <laughs> Going out or staying in? Staying in. <laughs> Listening to podcasts or music? Um, I'm in a podcast mood right now. Podcasts and audiobook. In case this is interesting, sorry, I'm slowing down the speed round. There's a great book right now that's rocking my world. It's called Metabolical. It is like everything I wish I could write a book about. So if anyone's interested, check it out. Metabolical. Amazing. No, that's great. That was the last question. Yeah. Seen. Anyway, that's a super great recommendation. We're going to have like such long show notes of everything. That great. <laughs> to learn about. <laughs> Just oh 900 gosh. links. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Sometime when you guys have time, we should come back and talk about a um, nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system reset. I operate this amazing medical device um, that is really great for sleep and anxiety and you know, all kinds of really cool things. Um, fitness too, but um, really kind of the unknowns are like anxiety and, um, and insomnia. And it, it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Part my, two, let's do it. Yeah. My degree is in neuroscience. So you could talk to me about that all day. Yay. <laughs> yeah. You should, t- I'll send you some info. It's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so happy to be able to talk to you, learn from you, learn about your accomplishments, your hardships, your journey overall. Um, and we know that it's going to inspire people to take action and chase their optimal wellness. Thank you guys so much for having me. I love chatting with you both. It was the best. You guys can all find Ryan on TikTok at ryan.habitmethodhealth and Instagram at habitmethodhealth. So definitely give her a follow and to become a part of our family and community, join us on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, all the platforms at and a diet soda. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. We hope you were able to give yourself a little love today. You deserve it. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and check us out on social media for weekly conversations and attainable challenges for your health.